Hey there, it's Professor McDonald. In this video, we're going to use the following theorems to find all the zeros of a polynomial function. So these theorems are ones that hopefully you've already seen and learned a little bit about in pieces. And I have them listed out here just for quick reference. And all of these images came from just snipping out of the open source free textbook, OpenStax College Algebra. So we're going to use the rational zero theorem, the remainder theorem, the factor theorem, the quadratic formula, and the zero product property as we work through these examples. So here's an example of a polynomial function f of x equals 4x cubed minus 8x squared minus 27x plus 45. We're going to begin with step one and I'm just going to talk about the steps first and then we'll actually do each one. So step one is we're going to use the rational zeros theorem where we list out all the possible values of x that we could plug in to the function and get a result of zero. And we're going to do that by using the last term and the front term or the lead term. Okay. We're going to list out all the possible rational zeros. We'll list all the p's because they're going to be in the form of p over q. And we're going to do positives and negatives. So all the p's first, which are the factors of the constant term. So we're going to take this last just number term with no x on it and figure out all the different factors, all the numbers that divide evenly into 45 and list those. Then we're going to list all the values that go evenly into the lead coefficient, 4 and those will be our q's, and then we're going to list every possible combination of p over q, both positive and negative, and those are the values, our short list of values that we can try and see if they give us a function value of zero. And when you get a function value of zero, you have an x-intercept, which is why this is so important to be able to do, because when you're graphing these things, knowing where the x-intercepts are, where the y value equals zero, is extremely helpful. Step two, we're going to use the remainder theorem. So in step one, we will have discovered one value, at least one value, that will give us a remainder of zero using synthetic division, or like I said, you can plug it in and see if it gives you zero. They both mean the same thing. This is saying that if a polynomial f of x is divided by x minus k, then the remainder is the value f of k. So um, to simplify this, uh, to understand how we're going to actually apply this, we're going to use the remainder theorem to test the potential k's, the potential zeros from this step, the p over q's. And when we're talking about synthetic division, we refer to them as k's. From the list in step one, we perform synthetic division looking for a remainder of zero. Step three, we will use the factor theorem which says that once you know that you have a zero, you can understand that that means, say if k is a zero, then x minus k is a factor of the function. So we're going to use the factor theorem with the zero that we found from step two and rewrite f of x in factored form. The first factor will be x minus k. Then we're going to use the last line of our synthetic division to form another polynomial factor. And keep repeating these steps one through three until we have a quadratic factor. Because if we have a quadratic factor, then we can use the quadratic formula. Or if it factors easily, you can just um, set each factor equal to zero. All right, so that's the overview of what we're going to do. Now let's apply it with this example here. So step one, step two, step three, and step four are all listed out here. All right, let's go through each one. Here is step one. So notice what I've done here is I took 45 and I listed in red here all the different numbers that go evenly into 45. Then I took the lead coefficient 4 and listed all the numbers that could go evenly into 4. Then I systematically took every one of the red numbers and put them over 1. So you can see that resulted in these this first set of numbers here, 1, 3, 5, 9, 15, and 45, as possible zeros of the function. 
Then I took every single one of the red numbers and put them over 2, and that resulted in all these 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves, 15 halves, and 45 halves, and then all of those numbers again over the divisor of 4. And you want to take care to also reduce any fractions that can be reduced. And if you get, if you reduce a fraction and it comes out to be one of the numbers you've already listed, you don't need to list it again. So this is my complete list of all the possible zeros, my p over q's. Oh, I'm missing something here. This should say over q, like it does up here. Okay. And that's going to give us the basis for the next step. So here's our list of p over q's. Now we're going to do step two, which is to use synthetic division to find a k, one of these values, these p over q's, um, which will yield a remainder of zero. Because using the remainder theorem, if we get, um, you know, when we do synthetic division, the last value in the last line here, that's your remainder. So notice that when I tried it with the first possible k, which is 1 here, and I did synthetic division, I got a remainder that was not 0. So that didn't work for us. I had to try again. So then I tried negative 1, and that also didn't give me a remainder of 0. It gave me a remainder of 6. So I got to keep going. Oh, and then I tried 3. So notice that I was starting with the positive 1, because that's an easy one to do negative 1, because that's an easy one to do with synthetic division, or even plugging them in. And then 3 was the next logical step. So I tried positive 3, and I got a 0. So that's great, because now, now that I've found 1, 0, I can go to the next step, and um, let's talk about it as we do it. We're going to use the factor theorem now. So knowing that k is a 0, so now we know that 3 is a 0 from the previous step, that means that x minus 3 must be a factor of the function. So notice down here, I've taken the result of, you know, my 0, x equals 3, and I created a factor that is x minus 3, and I also created a new polynomial, which involves, let me get a highlighter here, this value, is the coefficient, the lead coefficient, and then this one is the coefficient of my x term, and then this is the coefficient of my, con or it is my constant term. And notice that I made the degree of the new polynomial factor one less than the unfactored form of f of x. And you can see that the if you have um, three powers of x, here's two of them, well, here's the other one, okay? So we still have three powers of x there. Now, now that we've done this, we have a quadratic factor here. And since we already know how to solve quadratics, we can now factor this if it's factorable and set each one equal to zero to solve for x or use the quadratic formula. It's important to just say that you could repeat steps 1 through 3, um, or actually just 1 through 2 even, by doing synthetic division on more of these options here, okay, until you find up to 3. Well, you're going to have a total of 3 complex zeros, but that doesn't mean that they're all going to be real numbers, and these are, these are all rational real numbers. Um, some of the zeros could be irrational real numbers, and some of the zeros could be imaginary numbers. So it doesn't, to me, make sense to continue doing synthetic division on all of these values until you get three of them, because it is quite possible that you could go through every single value in the list and do synthetic division, or even just plug them into the function for x to see if you get zero. Um, hoping that you will eventually get the three zeros that you're looking for, because it's possible that those zeros are not in this list if they are um, non-real, like a complex number with an i in it, or if you have um, something that is a radical that doesn't simplify, you know, an irrational number. So it makes sense to get this far, 
And as soon as you have a quadratic factor, go ahead and solve it using either the quadratic formula or factoring. So that's what we're going to do, do next. So here we are moving from step three. Here's our factored polynomial. I took just the quadratic term and set it equal to zero. Then I tried to see if it would factor easily. I could have jumped right to using the quadratic formula, but I did, I did factor it. And then setting each one of these factors equal to zero, I solved for x and I got my two other zeros that I needed. So now that I know what all my zeros are, notice I was able to um, list f of x in totally factored form all the way down to linear factors and finally get my last answer. Okay, so to recap, I took my function, I listed out all the possible zeros and tried them until I found one that gave me a remainder of zero. Then I factored f of x, then I set the quadratic factor equal to zero and solved until I had all three of my answers that I needed for this problem. Let's look at another example. This example is for f of x equals x cubed minus 7x squared plus 8x plus 10x, or <laughs> I said that wrong, x cubed minus 7x plus 8x plus 10. And so we're going to go through those same steps again. We're going to list out our p over q's. Okay, so I took 10, the constant term over here, and figured out all the numbers that go evenly into, into 10. Same thing with the lead coefficient, which just happens to be 1, so there was only one factor. So it made it really easy and fast to list out all the possible p over q's, positive and negative. Okay, so now I'm ready to go to step two. I'm going to use synthetic division. And you would normally start most likely with the easiest number and see if that works. I tried it and it didn't work. I tried this one and it didn't work, so on and so on. And finally landed at one that gave me a remainder of zero. Next step, use the result from the previous step to write the first linear factor and then the result here, this line, to write the coefficients of my new polynomial factor that is one degree lower than the unfactored form of f of x, right? So now I have my two, I have two degrees of x here and one more here. All right, now I have a quadratic factor. So I can jump now to step four. Okay, so step four, I took my quadratic factor, set it equal to zero. Turned out that it was not factorable, so I used the quadratic formula. Okay, so remember the quadratic formula is you take the lead coefficient of x, and that's your a. So you can see I have my a there as one in the formula. Okay, then you take your middle term coefficient, and that's your b, okay, just plugging it in. Then you take your constant term, well that didn't work out very well, that color is not so nice, <laughs> but you take your negative 2 here and plug it in for c, okay. And simplifying that, and simplifying and simplifying, and um, you may need a refresher on how to simplify radicals, notice that I ended up with a radical uh, square root of 12, which is not a perfect square, but it does have a perfect square factor of 4. So I was able to simplify the square root of 4 as 2. And then um, I had this result, and then the 2 in the bottom went evenly into both. It canceled out with this 2 and this 2. So I got my final result, 1 plus or minus square root of 3, so that now I have two more zeros, and notice that these were irrational. So this is an example where I had 
one answer that was a rational real zero, which is five, that's rational real. And then I had two answers or zeros that were irrational and real. They're real and, but they're irrational. So notice that those irrational zeros don't end up on this list, right? And that's what I was trying to say before is that it could turn out that some of your zeros are not going to be on your list of P over Qs. So it doesn't make sense to just keep doing synthetic division or plugging in numbers until you get your answers because you might not ever find them that way. You have to know how to use synthetic division to factor your polynomial until you get something that you know how to solve. Okay, one more example here, guys. We have example three f of x equals 9x cubed plus 9x squared minus 43x plus 33. So step one, we take our 33, the constant term here, and find all the values, all the factors, which are the numbers that divide evenly into 33. Do the same for 9, which is the lead coefficient, okay? and then make your list. These are your P's over here, and these are your Q's. So I'm taking, what I usually do is I pick one of the Q's and I put all of my P's on top of that. So, so first we took this as a denominator, and then we did one over one is one, three over one is three, 11 over one is 11. Now we'll go to the next one. The next denominator will be three. So I'm going to take all of these and do 1 over 3 is 1 third. 3 over 3 equals 1 when you divide it, so we already have that. Then 11 over 3 is 11 thirds. Now we go on to the other and last denominator, and we put each one of these numbers on top of it. So 1 over 9 gives me 1 ninth. 3 over 9 reduces to one third, 11 over nine, 11 ninths, all right? So now that we have all of those listed, we're ready to go on to the next step. So now I start going through my list and trying some of these out. Remember, you can either plug in one into these, this polynomial to see if you get zero, or you can do synthetic division like I'm doing here. I like using synthetic division because to me, it's just as easy and Secondly, if you get a remainder of zero, then you can go on to um, factoring f of x more easily because you'll already have the coefficients of the second factor. So try them in order. Remember, do both positives and minuses of each number. So you can start with positive one. I tried that, it didn't work. Then I went to negative one and it didn't work. Then I went to positive three and it didn't work. Then I went to negative three and this did give me a remainder of zero. So now I know that x equals negative three is a zero of the function. In other words, there would be an x-intercept at negative three if we graphed it. That also means that x plus three is a factor of the function. So now we can go on to the next step. And now we have, as I said, x plus three is a factor, which means I can rewrite f of x with this as one of the factors, and then taking this line and reducing the original degree of the, the degree of the original polynomial minus one, I have a new factor, polynomial factor that is degree two. And this is the one that I can solve using either factoring or the quadratic formula. So I took my quadratic factor and set it equal to zero so I could solve for x, but it was not factorable, so I did use the quadratic formula, and after simplifying it, I figured out that I had two imaginary, two non-real zeros. Okay, so again, this is an example of where, you know, this only lists out all your rational possible, real rational. Rational means you can write it as a fraction, and there's no square roots or radicals that don't simplify. Anything else would be either considered real irrational, or if there's a negative underneath the square root like there is here, 
Remember the square root of a negative 1 is the imaginary unit i. So now this is in the complex imaginary number system. That means that you're not actually going to have an x-intercept at these two values. So there's only going to be, when you go to graph this polynomial, there's only going to be one x-intercept. And then these two are not going to show up on the graph because it's not, the graph is just an xy plane in the real number system. Um, so imaginary numbers don't really show up the way, you know, real numbers do. All right, so that was three examples of different scenarios, and you do a little work to find one real rational zero, then you get your quadratic and solve it for the other two zeros. Okay, so not so bad. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one.